All right, ladies, welcome to Flavor Sisterhood. We're in our third, whoops, third installment, three, 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 third installment of I Heart Me, and I have really loved this series. I hope you have too. Let me give a shout out to all the different locations. Um, we're excited that you are in the house, and um, it's going to be a good night. So tonight's um, title we started out with the I Heart Me series with It's All About Me. Then last time it was All About Thee. Tonight it's, um, I've entitled it Don't Buy the Lie. Don't Buy the Lie. And this is going to be an interesting thing because we're going to discover the difference between truth and lies. Now that seems to be pretty obvious, but um, so it's so easy for all of us to get pulled into um, the absence of truth, which we know is a lie, okay? So when it comes to me loving me, I mean, we clearly see that that's possible because God, the truth is God loved us first. God's perfect love, his agape love, um, was the payment for my inadequacies, my sins, all my failings. And because of that love that was lavished on me, I can love myself and love others. That's been the um, preface so far in our study. But as we look at that, it's all about me, then it's all about thee. Satan, the evil one, the devil, is working to keep us from that understanding and that application. It's about me understanding, it's about the application, but the devil comes in and says, hey, buy the lie, buy the lie, buy the lie, buy the lie. Now, I am not one to, you know, see a demon and a devil under every bush and around behind every chair and pillar of the church. I mean, you know, you can have a wacky view if you go chasing demons. Yeah, that, that can be scary. And what can happen there is the devil becomes exalted to a position he does not deserve because your attention goes to that. However, as Christ followers, what we have to remember is that the devil has lost the war. We have given our lives to Jesus Christ. He lost the war. But in his mind, he's thinking, well, the war may be over, but I have some battles I still want to wage. And he wants to do battle over your mind and my mind. Because the mind, I remember those, the ad campaign about drugs that said, the mind is a terrible thing to waste. And that's true. And the devil sees the real estate value of our minds. And so he has waged a battle. Even though the war is done, we are secure in Christ. But he knows that if he attacks and battles against our mind, then he can keep us from the will of God. That perfect will that God has for us. So it's important for us to know and to realize and to not just wink at the thought of there being an evil, sinister force in the world. There is evil in our world. If there were no sin, we would not have to be worrying about this. If there was no sin in the world, we would have a clear and perfect understanding of God's love. We would not only understand it, we would live it out, and we would not have to worry anymore. But the devil has waged a battle against our mind, trying to occupy and take away truth and substitute it for lies. This week I was mailing a package and I was in the line at the post office and there was a young woman at the counter mailing or doing whatever business she needed to do. And all of a sudden I heard the lady who was the postal employee, I have a fond, uh, connection because my father worked for the post office for 35 years. So I'm watching her in admiration, you know, as she, <laughs> as she receives the packages. I know sometimes you can get frustrated with the postal employees, but just remember my dad when you do. Um, so anyway, she takes the payment from the lady and she goes, honey, this is not a $10 bill. This is fake. And the girls just stand there with this sheepish look on her face. And she goes, I don't know where you got this, but this is not $10. And she takes the $10 bill and she hands it to her coworker. And she says, Ralph, feel this. Does that feel real to you? 
And he goes, well, no. So then she takes out this marker. She takes out a, a $10 bill from her cash drawer and dra draws through a line through it. And then she draws a line through the bill that the lady has just handed her. And they're different. You know, have you seen those markers before? Okay. She was trying to pass counterfeit money. You know how that postal employee knew it? Because she's handled the real thing. You handle the real deal, and then when the false comes through, you go, whoo, that's not right. Girl, put that back in your pocket. I'm not taking that. So for us to wink at sin, it would be kind of like her just accepting that $10 bill and just going along full well knowing it's not the real deal. But we can't put all of our focus on the devil and the devil's ways and the demons and all of this because we will end up exalting them. The secret to knowing how to deal with the devil and how to not buy the lies that he's giving us is to handle the real truth. That's what we're going to be talking about today. That's our focus is understanding and focusing on the real deal, which is the truth of God. Satan has a lie for whatever truth God has given us. He's the ultimate counterfeiter. In fact, Ed's, my husband Ed's very first message that he preached as a young pastor was entitled, The Devil Pays in Counterfeit Money. I will never forget that. I remember sitting on the front row just shaking because I'm thinking, he can do it, he can do it, I know he can do it, he can do it. And so I remember that. And that phrase is so true because the devil is the ultimate counterfeiter. And he knows he can't keep us out of the family of God, but he wages battle against our mind because our mind is where we house the image of God. You know, the Bible says we're created in the image of God. And that's where, yes, it's about our heart. Yes, it's about our bodies. But it's about our mind understanding who God is. There are so many scripture dealing with this that I have provided for you a, um, or actually our flavor team has provided for you a card that's going to give the scriptures. Because if we're going to be able to battle the lie, we got to know the truth. The Word of God. I'm just going to tell you, this is not in my notes. I'm veering off here. But I have been a Christ follower since I was nine years of age. I did not leave a life of terrible sinning at the age of nine. I mean, I'm sure I did my fair share of things that nine-year-olds do. But at that moment, by the grace of God and by the leadership of my family... We were planted in a local church, a Bible teaching church. In fact, that was the most important thing. It wasn't about denomination. It wasn't about any uh, group affiliation. It was about the word of God being taught. And at that point in my life, that is when I learned and continue to learn as I trusted God and, and read his word and sat under the teaching that his word never fails. Never, ever, ever. I mean, I... I and here I find myself, okay, at 53 years of age, and I'm going, guess what? It has not failed me in all of these years. Have I failed the word? Yes. But the word has never failed me because it is God's supernatural voice. God's supernatural voice in our lives. So as we look to the truth, I want us to remember that we have been given this love from God. The Bible says that we are adopted into his family. When we give our hearts over to him, when we say, God, I open the lid, of, uh, the heart, the lid on the heart of my life and I, I receive you, I know what you did on the cross and I receive that, we are adopted into the family of God. That word adoption is huge because it means in biblical uh, times, you could not disown a, an adopted child. You could disown a physically born child, whatever, you know your child. You could disown them, but you couldn't disown an adopted child. We are adopted into the family of God. This love has been lavished upon us. Just picture, if you will, maybe uh, a young woman who has um, maybe was orphaned at birth and struggled through life and gone from foster home to foster home, from foster home to foster home. And this 
individual has grown up in those circumstances and then she has worked so hard to finish high school and to go to college and taken on jobs and and trying to work out the finances and everything and then she's approached by a family who says guess what you're our daughter And this is a very influential family, a family that can come up alongside of her and say, you don't need to worry about your college education. We'll take care of it. You don't need to worry about a roof over your head. We'll take care of it. You'd call that a miracle, wouldn't you? But what if she said, you know, I've lived on my own for so long, I don't think I could receive what you're giving me, what you say is rightfully mine. I've, I've done these things in the past, so I can't be a part of this beautiful life that you're offering me. <laughs> Most of us go, uh, excuse me, young lady, you are so stupid. <laughs> you are just, I mean, that's just dumb. Because it's rightfully yours. You're a part of the family. This is your heritage. This is your, your life. And yet, as Christ followers, you know, we are adopted into the family of God, and all of this love and this peace and this forgiveness and all of these things are a part of our gift from being in the family of God. And yet, we kind of wink at it and say, but you don't understand. This is how I've lived my whole life. This is the life I know. I've done some things in the past. And we say no to the beautiful gifts that God has for us. How crazy is that? So we've got to learn to live in the truth of God. The fact that we are adopted into his family. We are daughters of the king. Dear me. Daughters of the king. Spiritually. Okay, so whatever your upbringing has been in the past and whatever circumstances you find yourself in or whatever um, location of the planet you're on and all the different things that make up you. Those are physical things. We're talking about spiritual. That's on a whole nother level (laughs) because that's eternal. This is eternal significance, eternal truth. It's not just an earthly physical thing. This is eternal. We have been adopted by the God of the universe, the one who created the heavens and the earth and put the stars in place and the, and the, the plants and the, I mean, just think about the creativity and all of that. And guess what? We're a part of that divine creation. Are you going to reject it? Because that's the lie of Satan. Um, you know, you've been raised this way and you grew up knowing this and you experienced that and you partook in this and remember when you were involved in that and blah, 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 blah. That's the lie that Satan wants you to buy. He doesn't want you to go, wow, I'm a child of the king. I have a, an inheritance that's supernatural. No, no. He wants to give you the counterfeit of that. Think back to the Garden of Eden. (laughs) He went after the first woman, of course. And he presents himself to Adam and to Eve and says, Look, Eve, God's basically ripping you off. And God said this, but really he meant this. He omitted things that God had said. He took away things that God had said. He totally changed the truth and presented it to Eve in an appealing fashion. And we've been on a downward spiral ever since. So it's all about knowing the truth. Not only knowing it, but processing it in our lives so that we can enjoy and experience the heritage and inheritance that God has given us right now. We don't have to wait for it in the future. We can experience it right now. So I want to give you basically just, oh, I think it's five, yeah, five truths that we have to operate, have operating in our lives. Five things that will keep truth at the forefront and that will help us have our minds secure in what God says about our lives and not what the devil says about our lives. So number one, realize what is at stake. What's at stake? It's my mind. 
Satan is going for my mind because he knows that this is where I hold the image of God. This is where I think, and my thoughts are so huge. And because I'm a woman, I've got a lot of emotions, and my emotions well up inside of me, and then they go into my brain, and they start working. And the brain is a very fascinating thing, very fascinating. I remember when EJ was a little baby, you know, he has neurofibromatosis, so we would take him to MD Anderson, and he would do these MRIs. And, and one of the cool things, EJ was three years old, and he could do an MRI without being sedated. Very rare. And the neurologist in Houston would, asked me, they said, would you consider letting him do a test study to, so we could ask him questions while he's in the MRI because when we ask him these questions, it's going to fire off things in his brain and we'll be able to see that and understand what parts of the brain activate. And I mean, I was like, that was so fascinating. We couldn't do it because we lived so far, you know, we lived in Dallas, it was going to be difficult to do. But how cool would it be if we could go inside our brains and kind of see where everything is formulating and all the stuff that's going on in there? I don't know, it might be a little scary. <laughs> Or maybe what's not going on in there. That might be what's scary. But we have to realize that what's happening up here affects our bodies. It affects how we live out each day. It affects our relationships because it's this perception, this mind perception. So we have to realize what is at stake. There's a battle going on for our mind. This is what Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 11 verse 3. He said, but I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. You see, the gospel, though intricate, is not something that we can't comprehend. On the one hand, we can't comprehend all the mysteries of God, but it is a very simple uh, theology. I'm a sinner. I'm messed up, imperfect, and I serve a perfect God, and he can't have a relationship with me. Therefore, there had to be a sacrifice, somebody to take my sin. It's Jesus. So because of my sin, I can't know God. God provided Jesus. Because of Jesus, I can know God. That's it. We don't have to complicate it. Now, there's lots of other things. There's mysteries that we do not understand. But that is the simplicity and the purity of being devoted to Christ. The devil wants you to think, oh, it's way more than that. It's works-based. I've got to behave a certain way. I've got to do a certain thing. Now, you know what? God is all about the transformation after we receive Jesus. We make a decision to follow Christ, and it's followed by a process. But it is not a process that brings us necessarily to a decision in salvation. It's not. It's not by works. And the devil wants to exchange that grace thing for works. So we receive the gift of Jesus Christ. Then we let God change us. Because you and I can't do it on ourselves, by ourselves. We can't. This is about me living in the will of God. Number two. Take responsibility for the truth. Take responsibility. Stop blaming other people for your mind and your thoughts. It is so easy to blame. We can blame our parents. We can blame um, Hollywood. <laughs> we can blame Time Warner Cable. I don't know who. But we tend to blame others, our spouse, and we say, well, if they had not done that, I would not be in this situation. You know what you've done when you do that? What I've done when I do that? I have elevated that individual over God. They have more power over me than God. And nobody can do that except for you. Nobody can do that except for me. I'm the only person who can elevate someone else into a position that only God deserves. So I've got to stop blaming others. John 8, 44 says, He was a murderer from the beginning, speaking of the devil, and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature. He is a liar, the father of lies. The father of lies wants you to believe that it's everybody else's fault that you're thinking the way you're thinking. And it's at some point... 
we have to believe what the Bible says. In fact, the Bible says that when we receive Jesus Christ, we are a new creation. The old is past and the new has come. The book of Ephesians talks about, um, the writer tells how the Ephesians, the people of Ephesus, behaved prior to coming into a relationship with Christ. And then he says, but remember, that was your old self. Here's your new self. So, the, and, and the pages of the New Testament is all about that, how people were changed because of Jesus and they live a new life. So if you're thinking it's somebody's fault from your past, from your childhood, your diapers pinned too tight, your nursery painted the wrong color, whatever it might be, your kindergarten teacher was, you know, not the right teacher, I don't know. But it's, it's so amazing to me how we go back and we blame others for our mindset. This is the truth. This is the truth. So don't elevate the position of somebody else from your past, from your present, whatever, to take that spot of God. If you're giving them that much authority in your life, that's your situation, my situation. God is greater. God is stronger. God is higher. He is the authority in our life, and he's the author of truth. So that's number two, take responsibility for the truth. Number three, choices, choices, choices. Choices, choices, choices. Think of your life as a remote control, like for the television. Now, I'm old enough to remember a time when there was no remote control. I was the remote control because we would be watching TV as a family, and my father would say, Lisa, will you go turn the channel? And you would actually turn a knob on a box. I was the remote control. But think about your life as a remote control. You have options. But just because something is an option does not mean it is worthy of your attention and time. So there are many things available to you and me that are not worthy of our attention and time. How about, and ladies, I am preaching to myself, the unreal housewives of anywhere. Not the real housewives, but the unreal housewives of anywhere. I have yet to see a housewife on television that resembles what I look like in my house. <laughs> so I'm just telling you, we have options. We need to monitor our social media. We need to monitor what we're looking at, what movies we're going to. And I am not prudish. But I'm telling you that if you're struggling with your image, if you're struggling with loving yourself the way God has loved you, you are the object of his perfect love, then you might need to say no to some things in order to have that pushed aside so the truth could come in. That's right. That's right. Okay, so we have to understand our choices. Philippians 4, 8 says, Finally, whatever is true, Whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute. If there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on those things. Well, it actually says dwell on these things. That's what we should be doing. So before we go blame somebody else, before we minimize you know, the importance of knowing the truth, we have got to say no, make some choices personally, res assume responsibility personally, and then make the choices that need to be made. To say no, 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 yes. Maybe that's the pattern. It should be a little rhythm. No, 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 yes. <laughs> kind of like that. So let's make the right choices so we know the truth. Number four. Deal with stinking thinking. If, it's, if it isn't truth, it's a lie. You know, we talk about a half-truth um, or a little white lie. <laughs> a little white lie is a lie. It's just a color or a non-color. It's a lie. If it's not truth, it's a lie. Deal with stinking thinking. Okay, yesterday... I went to fix lunch, and I had some leftover black beans and rice. And, and Ed and I are not totally vegetarian, but we do eat a lot of vegetarian-type meals and such. So I was just going to have beans and rice and guacamole. Well, I took the rice and the beans out of the refrigerator, and I'm not kidding you. Before I even opened the Tupperware, there was a stench that it just about knocked you off your feet. I mean, I think even the dogs ran. And so I was like, wow, I mean, I didn't think they should be spoiled. 
And I had cooked the rice with vegetable broth, so I thought, that shouldn't really be spoiled. So I'm smelling, I'm smelling, and I'm like, oh my gosh. And, and I thought, this is not good. So I threw it away. I put the beans down the disposal and ran the disposal just a little bit. I put the rice in the trash can, because it was a lot, and you know, they say ri rice can clog your pipes or whatever. So anyway, I'm trying to figure all that out. And I just put the Tupperware in the sink and left it. I had other things to do. And I came back in yesterday afternoon. I'm like, oh my gosh, it still stinks. Whew. I thought I got rid of that. And then I thought, oh my gosh, I need to take the trash out. So I wrapped up the trash, took it out. It's a little better. And I was like, Gosh, it still stinks. Now, Ed is out of town. He's coming back today. So <laughs> this is, hopefully, I've resolved this issue because he has the nose of all noses. <laughs> he, can, he can smell something bad. I mean, like that. So I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, this is really rare for me because if I can smell it, it's bad. So I'm thinking, oh, I need to run the dishwasher, dis disposal. So I put baking soda down the disposal. Thought that's gonna help. Ran the disposal. I'm like, oh my gosh, it still stinks. So I washed the dishes. I thought I'm just gonna have to break down and wash the dishes. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that dreaded chore that eventually comes. And so I washed the dishes. And finally, it's like, wow, I can smell palm olive dish soap versus the stinky beans. Now, what really is going to happen is when I cook tonight, I'm going to cook something really good because my husband is coming home and my son's going to be back in town. I'm going to like, woohoo, we're going to eat good tonight. When I get that aroma in there, whew, you're not even going to know we had beans in the house. But see, I had to work to figure out where the stink was coming from. And it didn't take just one quick little fix. I had to go here, and I had to go here, and I had to go here. And then, now I'm going to substitute to bring something really good in, a great fresh aroma, to take its place. You see, wherever you pull away the lie, you need to fill it in with truth. Pull away the lie and fill it in with truth. Proverbs 23, 7 says, For as he thinks within himself, so he is. Now, physicians will tell you, you are what you eat. Well, not literally. Like, if you eat an apple, you're not going to turn into an apple. But eventually, what you eat does determine a lot about your physiological state, okay? Psychologists will say, you are what you think. So it's important for us to get the stinking thinking, the lies of Satan, out and put the truth in. That's how we live. Number five, live in truth. Live in truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Okay, do you remember back? I don't even know. I really need to ask an attorney who goes to court if they still do that, where you raise your hand and I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Knowing our culture today, maybe they've taken out the so help me God. I don't know. But we hear that. I'm going to live in the truth, the whole truth, not fragmented truth, the whole truth. So help me God. Guess what? We can't do it without God. That's an important part that we cannot omit. So help me God. Romans 8, 6 says, For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. There's a psychological arm argument. You're messing with my mind, the psyche. There's a physiological argument. You're messing with my body. The devil's messing with my body because so my mind thinks then, then I'm going to behave a certain way. It messes with my body. But I would argue that the biggest argument is a theological argument. Don't mess with my God, my Abba Father, my Daddy. Listen, if somebody were to attack my earthly father, because I had a great relationship with him, he's gone on to be with the Lord, but if somebody were to attack my dad, you know what? Lisa's going to come out fighting. The devil should never be able to mess with our God. God can handle it, but it's what we allow him to do. 
Yes, it's a psychological argument. It's a physiological argument. But more than anything, it's a theological argument. And for far too long, too many of us who call ourselves Christ followers are letting the devil get away with stuff. Don't let him have control of your mind. Put your mind set on the spirit because in that is life and peace. So many of us have turmoil inside because we're just not at peace. We're not at peace with ourselves. We're not, and if we're not at peace with ourselves, we're certainly not going to be at peace with our family, our coworkers, and everyone else. But it goes back to this theological question. It's about God. Theos is about God. Are we at peace with God and what he says, his truth? Or are we buying the lie? You see, this is a spiritual issue. How do we live in the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help me God. Three things, God's word. We've got to open his word. Do not expect to be transformed in your mind or in your day or in how you live if you do not open God's word. And I'm not talking about coming to church on Sunday, coming to Flavor on Wednesday and thinking, oh, I got my Wednesday fix. Now I'm going to wait till Sunday. Open God's word. It's miraculous. I'm not kidding you. It doesn't matter if you just have Three minutes, but you read God's word. You say, God, soak this into my life. Put this in my mind. I want you to be prevalent in my life. It's supernatural what happens, but you know, God's, God's word, I mean, we have it. Do you realize there are countries that don't have this book? We have it, and yet it's like, oh, well, I might, I might not, but I, you know, it's more important for me to get dressed in the morning and put on my makeup and all of this kind of stuff, and I want to make sure this, and you know, I really was out late last night, I think I'm going to sleep in, and I don't have time to get up and study God's word. Really? And your life's all messed up, and you go, well, whose fault is it? Assume responsibility. This is God's word. It is how we live in the truth, his word. Also, we live through God's word, God's house. I'm not minimizing flavor or, or the events that we have on the weekend, you know, our weekend services. I'm not minimizing that because there's a place for it. But you need to be studying God's word. You need to be a self-feeder throughout the week. Don't wait for your meal just to be twice a week. Eat all week long. That's healthy. You come on Wednesdays to flavor. You're here most importantly for the weekend. It's the weekend stupid. That's our mantra around here. We plan, we, we purpose, we do everything for the weekend because that is the time where we gather corporately and God speaks to us. And we might not always like the music or we might think, well, I don't know about that series. It doesn't matter. Commit. Be in God's house. You will experience truth in God's house. The third thing, God's people. And you're going to meet, you know, you know, the, I can't do that little thing. You know, here's the church. Here's the steeple. <laughs> Open the door and see all the people. I did it. Okay. I was afraid. I'm, I'm motor skill challenged sometimes. So anyway, here's the church. There's the steeple. Open the door and see all the people. That's where you're going to meet godly people. We're going to have relationships with people who are far away from God. We're commanded to do that. But our closest friends are going to be those who are connected to the house, serving in the house, a part of the church. They're going to be studying God's word. They're going to be living on that page. of Their, their lives are, are revolved around truth. You see, that works. It works. Don't buy the lie. God loves you. He has a magnificent plan for your life, but Satan is attacking the minds of Christ followers and saying, you are not valued by God. You are not loved by God. You are only as good as your past. And God is saying, no, you're as good as Christ Jesus who lives within you. That's the truth. That's the truth. When we go into a store, and this has been true from the time that my kids were really little, if they wanted to buy something and they thought I was going to pay for it, they go, Mom, Mom, look, can I have this, can I have this? And if I said, well, you know, you get an allowance and you have money, so if you want it, that's awesome, but you're paying. Ooh, kind of changes the perspective, doesn't it? It makes them think, hmm, not so sure if I want that or not, because I thought Mama was paying. So often, we're willing to buy the lie that Satan has for us because we think somebody else is paying. 
And if we think somebody else is paying, it might be because we have not fully received what has been given to us by God. His love, his will, his truth, the ability to be in his house and to serve. Maybe we haven't received what is rightfully ours as his adopted children. And so therefore we're thinking, well, I don't have anything to pay with. So I'm willing to give to Satan, and I'll trade this. I'll exchange this because somebody else is paying. But if we have received all of these things, and I'm just going to raise my hand. I have. I have. I'm not going to let Satan have that. It's nothing that he has on the shelf in the store is worth what Jesus has given me. Right. Nothing. Right. Nothing. Nothing. Don't buy the lie. John 8, 31, 32 says, If you know the truth, and these are the words of Jesus, the truth will set you free. Father, I thank you for our time together, for your word, for this message that I need to hear in my life. God, I know I am your child, and I want to live fully in that realm. I am a child of the King. And of course, Father, we always want to offer this opportunity to others who are gathered in all the different environments that if you have never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you've never received the love that he's lavished upon you because you are the object of his love, I am the object of his love, then you need to make that decision right now. I'm telling you, it is the decision that will change the trajectory of your life. Just say, God, I open up my heart to you. I know that outside of Jesus, I cannot have a relationship with you because I am imperfect. I've messed up. On my best day, I'm not good enough. And you are a perfect and holy God. But you so desire a relationship with me that you provided Jesus who took my sin, who has forgiven me, so that I can have a relationship with you. Thank you, God, for saving me. God, we thank you again for this time together. I thank you for transformations that are going to take place as we live out the truth that we are your children with a purpose so great that we are going to change the world. In Jesus' name, amen.